Hello A-level language and literature students. In this video lesson we are going to analyze the poem Litany from the Carol Ann Duffy collection Meantime as found on the AQA language and literature A-level syllabus. Now you may be familiar uh, about my suggestion that you individually read the poem yourself multiple times before you focus on this video. Um, if you can, read it aloud and obviously explore the sense of voice within the poem. My own reading might sound something like this, Litany. The soundtrack was then a litany, candlewick, bedspread, three-piece suite, display cabinet. And stiff-haired wives balanced their red smiles, passing the catalogue, Pyrex. A tiny ladder ran up Mrs. Barr's American tan leg, sly, like a rumour. Language embarrassed them. The terrible marriages crackled, cellophane round polyester shirts, and then the lounge would seem to bristle with eyes, hard as the bright stones in engagement rings, and sharp hands poised over biscuits, as a word was spelled out. An embarrassing word, broken to bits, which tensed the air like an accident. This was the code I learnt at my mother's knee, pretending to read, where no one had cancer, or sex, or debts, and certainly not leukaemia, which no one could spell. The year a mass grave of wasps bobbed in a jam jar. A butterfly stammered itself into my curious hands. A boy in the playground, I said, told me to fuck off, and a thrilled, malicious pause salted my tongue like an imminent storm. Then, uproar. I'm sorry, Mrs. Barr, Mrs. Hunt, Mrs. Emery, sorry, Mrs. Rain. Yes, I can summon their names. My mother's mute shame. The taste of soap. In summary, this poem recalls the childhood memory of listening to gossiping housewives in the 1950s or the 1960s. These women prudishly censor their gossip by spelling out certain words. Then the child swears to the disgust of the group and is forced to apologise and has her mouth washed out with soap. The themes in this poem are very much appearance and reality, uh, superficial appearance of the woman uh, and the direct reality of the child's language. The uh, themes of age and youth, of uh, memory, of growing up, and I guess growing up to kind of accept the values of a society that you grow into. Uh, language is a key theme of this poem and the idea of taboo, um, of for forbidden or unspeakable ideas. The poem is narrative and has the feel of a personal anecdote. It is probably autobiographical, being that the details and the time frames uh, reasonably uh, coincide with Duffy's own uh, life. What you think she is personally trying to convey in this poem about uh, this time, about these kinds of people, or about the importance of childhood events like that is for you to decide for yourself and you will have your own valid interpretation of the meanings in this poem. Uh, a little key knowledge though uh, is worth exploring as this poem is set in the 50s and 60s it's worth thinking about some of the social values it explores. Women were expected to take the role of a housewife and would receive a portion of their husband's wage for housekeeping and this was at a time of burgeoning consumerism. Uh, a range of new household products had become available. And the women in this poem and their obsession with the catalogue are presented somewhat as shallow and materialistic, uh, focused on what they can buy with their husband's money. These catalogues, which I suppose are now replaced by internet shopping, uh, were a way of deciding how those women would spend that money. And I suppose in a society in which kept them confined in the house, 
Um, spending money in this way was their perhaps only way of exercising um, decisions or exercising power and agency in the world around them. This was a deeply moralistic society in the 50s and 60s. Um, yes, there is the uh, sexual revolution of the 60s, but as we discussed in Captain, there are still um, uh, repressions in society, particularly related to ideas like sex. And in some ways, uh, the sexual revolution and the um, more progressive outlook of the 1960s, as we can see in this poem, did not extend to middle class housewives. Respectable people, um, which these people are, project this image of perfection and of cleanliness. Topics like sex are taboo and carry associations of deep shame. What is a litany? A litany is a kind of religious prayer that takes the form of a very long list of items uh, read out. And here it is analogous to the household catalogue and as we'll see in close examination also um, has its kind of analogue in the final stanza. American tan apparently is a popular shade for tights. Pyrex is a brand of cookware and you might have some Pyrex ovenware in your cupboards um, in the kitchen. Parents have a tradition of spelling out taboo words when speaking amongst children as a way of obscuring the meanings of these terrible things. Um, this is the code referred to in the poem. And also uh, traditionally there is a, a kind of... Um, an idiomatic, you hope, uh, or I would like to hope, threat, um, one that perhaps only exists in language. I don't, I hope people don't actually do this or didn't actually do this to their children because it's quite abusive. But uh, the idea is that if you speak and use dirty language, um, parents would often threaten to wash your mouth out with soap or would tell children to wash their mouth out with soap. Of course, in the poem, we are led to believe that this is something that actually happened uh, to the uh, to the voice in the poem. Let's have a look at some of those distinctive linguistic features within this poem. With regards to the Lexis, there are a, a litany of household items presented as concrete nouns in this poem. For example, the Candlewick bedspread three-piece suite display cabinet. Pyrex, American tan, cellophane, polyester, but also um, some of some of which are uh, kind of um, trade names or particular like product names, um, such as Pyrex and American tan. Uh, others of which are just material possessions like engagement rings, the lounge, the biscuits, the soap. All of these are kind of household items, perhaps related to this imprisonment of women in this role, in this really restricting role of the housewife. So these items form a kind of a litany, uh, an endless list of household goods, um, which really allude to this shallow materialism of the women. The material nouns are contrasted with some of those taboo terms which they spell out, um, which are mostly um, abstract ideas like sex, cancer, debts and leukemia, which as we know no one can spell. Um, so we have these two groups of nouns forming a kind of um, contrasting um, lexical fields between this acceptable world of material presentation and perfection and this unacceptable dark hidden um, world of taboo subjects which um, the women enjoy and gossip but try and keep concealed from the ears of their children. Within the poem, there is um, some curious natural imagery in stanza three, um, which has a kind of symbolic connection to the scene in the lounge, although it appears disconnected from the rest of the poem in some ways. Um, this is the description of wasps which bobbed in a jam jar, which I feel very much is a symbolic uh, metaphor for the gossiping women. Uh, waspish is often used as a personal adjective to describe someone who is um, unforgiving or harsh. Um, and I feel that that's very much um, a good way of describing those women. But also this jam jar, the fact that they are bobbing in a jam jar in this uh, kind of domestic captivity. And significantly, of course, a jam jar being a kitchen household item. 
So very much I feel like those wasps buzzing away in the jam jar represents the way that the women themselves are trapped in the lounge uh, with making their idle gossip. The butterfly perhaps is a more obvious symbol of uh, childhood growth and change. And this is foregrounded in many ways through Duffy's choice of the verb stammered. Um, that implies an awkwardness with language, which is very good at capturing the kind of uneven way that a butterfly flies. But it also um, perhaps represents this early failure to say the right thing or the uncertainty of growing up um, and learning what is proper and what is not proper to say. Finally, there is a lot of irony and humour um, um, thinking about the pragmatics of this poem uh, and the way that this uh, narrative is told. There are a lot of um, kind of suggested shared meanings beneath the surface. Uh, the child's growing awareness of taboos from these decoded spelled words is presented ironically. No one had cancer or sex or debts. Well, quite clearly, that is conveying that there are people who have cancer and sex and debt. But also it's really showing us the way that the women are trying to uh, uh, are trying to conceal this uh, from the listener. Duffy takes the opportunity here uh, to mock the women. They are, of course, spelling out words letter by letter in an attempt to um, conceal what's being said from the child. Um, but nobody, uh, they, these people certainly don't have leukemia, which no one could spell. So there's a little bit of mockery there towards the women, um, which creates a kind of humour in contrast to a very serious topic. Uh, leukemia being obviously a very serious disease. So... Um, this inability to communicate is basically um, poked fun at. Um, that joke is made even more obvious, really, with the intensifying adverb, certainly not for leukemia. Um, for a close analysis, um, if we look at the um, final stanza here, a number of interesting features present themselves. Throughout the poem, there is a semantic field of speech. This is very much a poem about language and the way people speak. We have words like pause, said, told, tongue, uproar, summon, names, and mute. Um, and within this their semantic field, we get that contrast between noise and silence. We get movements between violence and sudden shifts in volume within this stanza, the malicious pause, and then the uproar, for example. Uh, the use of taste imagery is a kind of a synesthetic metaphor for language. Remember that synesthesia uh, occurs in a text where there is a kind of a sensory metaphor um, where an unpredictable um, sense is used to describe language. That's present there in the fact that a malicious pause salted my tongue. It's almost presenting the way that... Um, the, uh, the child can taste having done something wrong. That image uh, forms a kind of a parallel use of imagery with the final line where she tastes the soap. Presumably she was actually uh, given soap or soap was actually put in her mouth as a punishment. But those sensory descriptions are helping to evoke this power of memory and particularly the uh, feelings of shame that are associated with it. If you notice in the blue there, there are little grammatical shifts uh, into the present. Um, so the, sh the past tense storytelling uh, narrative shifts into the present tense in that final line where um, Duffy writes, yes, I can summon their names. Uh, this shows us how this is a memory being had by an adult at a much later date. Um, it's one of those things that really makes it feel like, like a Duffy's personal story. Uh, and that she's telling an autobiographical anecdote here. Uh, the final two sentences are presented as these verbless fragments. They have no tense. Uh, my mother's mute's shame, the taste of soap. They are, in a sense, kind of timeless and persisting. Um, finally, if for close analysis, we could look at the way that varied forms uh, help to create a kind of dramatic tension in this stanza. The italics here are uh, representing direct speech, uh, and the voice of the child. Um, 
that probably should be highlighted at the top there. A boy in the playground, I said, told me to fuck off. Um, this is structured in the way that you might deliver a joke. Um, the punchline, the delivery line is placed at the, um, at the back uh, in order to add additional impact. So we have the reporting clause, I said, inserted in the middle of that um, speech as a way of kind of pausing and slowing down the delivery of uh, the final uh, impact. Um, then we have this semicolon, the conjunction, uh, leading to this thrilled, malicious pause, salted my tongue like an imminent storm. And it not only describes, but the sentence form itself kind of strings out uh, the reaction so that you get this sense of very, very tense silence before that fragment delivers the impact, then uproar. And the fragment is broken, you'll notice it, in, it is uh, enjammed between the two lines, um, which helps, I think, to accentuate that sudden shift into the woman's explosive reaction at having heard the word fuck. Um, finally, then, we get this list. I'm sorry, Mrs. Barr, Mrs. Hunt, Mrs. Emery, sorry, Mrs. Rain. Um, this, once more, could be another litany like the litany of household items that was um, recounted in stanza one. Uh, this is a litany, a list of kind of names, um, which all of which uh, the speaker can remember. A way of perhaps showing how she's uh, memorized the shamefulness of this experience. A few things that you might do with this poem, uh, once you're assured at analysing it, you could look at the way that shocking events are presented in both this poem and in Stafford Afternoons, particularly the way that narrative structures build up tension. You could compare the presentation of parent and child relationships in Cliché Kid, which are more or less realistic in the two poems and have a, both have aspects of humour. You could look at a presentation of motherhood in Before You Were Mine. Both this and Before You Are Mine are um, uh, have uh, anecdotal and autobiographical feels. Um, and so it's interesting to see the way that Duffy appears to present her own mother in different ways. You could also look at the way the past is presented in this poem compared to a poem like Never Go Back. Finally, some more words for you to reflect on. When we are young, we do terrible and shameful things. And this is a fantastic poem uh, written by Simon Armitage from his excellent collection, Book of Matches. I am very bothered when I think of all the bad things I have done in my life. Not least that time in the chemistry lab when I held a pair of scissors by the blades and played the handles in the naked lilac flame of the Bunsen burner, and then called your name and handed them over. Oh, the unrivalled stench of branded skin as you slipped your thumb and middle finger in, then couldn't shake off the two burning rings. Marked, the doctor said, for eternity. Don't believe me, please, if I say... That was just my butter-fingered way, at thirteen, of asking you if you would marry me. Thanks for your focus and good luck with your studies.